Hey, what's up gamers? So, in my last video, I started making a survival game for the NES. It's been a while, so what have I done so far? The first step was to improve my debugging experience on the FCUX emulator. If I haven't done that, it would be a nightmare and I would not be making this video. I modify the make file, so every time the game is built, the linker would export debug and label data. Then I borrowed this excellent Python script to convert the label data so the FCUX emulator would understand it. And voila, after launching my game and opening the debugger, I can finally see all the label and variable names. Now it's much more easier to set a breakpoint exactly where I need it. Plus, I can easily find the variables in the hex editor. The next step was to implement the basic collision detection. If you watched my last video, you probably already know that the single NES screen is basically a 32 by 30 grid. So I created 120 byte array in the ROM, where each single bit represents a grid cell. So if a bit there is set to 1, then that means the player should not be able to go through that cell. This way I hoped to save some memory. I sat down and using the text editor I filled all the bits based on the existing tile map. My idea was to check four player points against that collision grid. But I made a mistake and specified same two points twice. But the collision still kinda worked okay. So I left it this way for now. Since the collision detection somewhat worked and you could finally bump into things, it was time to make that you could enter the hut. I drew a screen for the hut's interior. As you can see the hut is pretty much empty so far. Then I made it if character's center intersects the door's rectangle, this very screen is loaded to the PPU. Also I had to load a different palette for the background tiles. Because as I found out, it's pretty much impossible to draw everything using a single background palette set. Unless your game is black and white of course. When the player entered the hut for the first time, the collision was all wrong. Because the collision map was still the same as for the outdoors. I had to create a 120 byte chunk in the RAM, so I could load different collision maps to it from the ROM. Now finally I could go inside and outside and the collision just worked. And I was really happy about it. Basically I could already build the whole game this way. Using different screens that could be loaded from the ROM. But as I said in my previous video it would be a sin if we were not gonna use the background scrolling. So let's get to it. As I've mentioned before the PPU has an access to 2 kilobytes of video RAM. Unfortunately, we can barely squeeze just two 32 by 30 background screens in it, since the single screen is exactly 1024 bytes. As I said before, there are two configurations, the horizontal and vertical mirroring. One of those can be set by soldering contacts together in the cartridge. If you would select the horizontal mirroring, the screens in video memory would be arranged this way, while with the vertical mirroring it would look like this. It actually doesn't matter which mirroring is used. You can still scroll the background in both horizontal and vertical directions by writing to the scroll register. So in my game I wanted to do a basic horizontal scrolling for now. but. I had a horizontal mirroring set previously. Even though you hear the word horizontal, this type of mirroring is not fit to do a side scrolling. Unless I want to loop the same screen over and over. But I don't. So I had to switch to the vertical mirroring in the ROM's header. This way I could have two different screens placed side by side horizontally. So I drew a second wilderness screen with a bunch of trees and rocks and loaded to the second screen address. 
and when I try to scroll horizontally, I could finally see my new screen appearing. Then I try to improve the scrolling, so that it would match the character's movement. So at the beginning, the character can be moved horizontally only until it reaches the middle of the screen. Then basically the character stays in one place while the world moves by until you reach the last part of the map. Then you can move your character again to the right edge of the screen. It worked great, but while moving around I've noticed some strange glitches. The screen started jumping up and down. What the heck is going on? Apparently I've put too much code into the non-maskable interrupt. So what the hell is this interrupt? So basically your average NES game has these two code blocks. Your main code that starts when you reset the NES, usually it has an eternal loop at the end. And there is this non-maskable interrupt code block. The CPU executes it during the vertical blanking interval. So the CPU interrupts the execution of the main application code and jumps straight into the non-maskable interrupt and starts executing it. I actually tried to put my whole game into this interrupt while my main loop was completely empty. By the way, many commercial games work that way. Pretty good example is the Super Mario Brothers. But the thing is, the NMI has a limited execution time. So you can't put a huge amount of calculations in it. So it was time to change things. I had to put the game logics inside the main application loop and everything that's related to the PPU I left in the non-maskable interrupt. Only one thing to remember, if you put any code into your eternal loop, you have to save your CPU register values when the NMI starts and restore registers when it ends. Otherwise you will witness some weird glitches. So my background scrolling between two screens now worked fine. But the collision detection only worked in the first screen and I definitely needed to fix that. I needed to somehow update my collision map while the background was scrolling. So for starters how about I make the collision work when the character moves to the right. I decided to shift bits left using the arithmetic shift left instruction when you scroll past a single grid cell. When the most significant bit is shifted out of the byte, it falls into the CPU's carry flag. And then the rotate left instruction is used to move that bit from carry flag to the next byte. I also allocated additional column in the RAM with the data from the next screen. So when you scroll past 8 grid cells, this column needs to be updated. Finally it was done and I had a collision detection while moving right. But when I tried to go left, the collision detection obviously did not work. So I started writing another very similar subroutine that shifts bits to the right by using logical shift right instruction and rotate right instruction. I also added another helper data column on the left side. It was super hard to get the collision right when the map was scrolling both ways. At that moment I wished my game was like Super Mario Bros. It would have been so much easier. It took me a couple of days of trial and error when I finally figured out how to make that the collision detection and the scrolling would work together nicely. During that time the FCUX hex editor was my good friend and the only way to see what's going on with the collision data when I was moving around. And I finally made it. At the moment I saw that my collision detection finally worked, I was, was so happy. Until suddenly, after moving around in the map randomly, I've noticed that my character bumped into an invisible obstacle. No. No, this can be happening. No! I could not understand why it is this way. What the heck went wrong? Everything seemed so good in theory. After sitting and thinking for one more day, I finally noticed that the collision data messes up only when I crash into some obstacle back and forth. And then 
I understood. I used to shift my collision map during the character's movement. After bumping into some obstacle, I would revert character's XY coordinates to the previous position and also I would revert scroll amount. But the collision map still remained shifted. So the solution was to only shift the collision map after the collision was checked. Guess what? It actually worked. I felt relieved. So it was time to do something fun for a change. I made so the player could change its frames when it moved to the different directions. Of course there are only three basic frames. I used the horizontal flipping in the OM to flip the character when it moved left and right. Also since the character is made of four sprites, I had to shift the sprite indexes when the character was flipped or the character would look totally wrong. After that, instead of adding some walk animations, I've decided to add some variety to the gameplay. So I added warmth mechanics. Basically the warmth stat constantly decreases and when it reaches zero, the HP starts decreasing as well. And when you run out of health points, you go to the title screen. Then I made that if you enter the house, the warmth stops from falling and actually starts increasing. Thus, by staying indoors, you can keep yourself alive. As a final change, I made this simple fire animation. Basically by updating two background tiles over and over. Last time I promised that I will use my own cartridge instead of the flash card. So let's do that. Basically my cartridge was wired like this. Nothing too fancy. Just 264 kilobyte EEPROMs and a prototype board which is mounted on a dead Famiclone cartridge like some kind of a parasite. <laughs> so let's try to write the latest ROM to it. I used the Famirom application to split my NES file into two parts. You can choose the EEPROM size from the drop down menu and the application will duplicate the content to fill that size. Since my EEPROMs are 64 kilobytes, the PRG is duplicated two times and the CHR eight times. Then I popped in EEPROMs one by one into the programmer and wrote the images I got. So I stick the chips into the cartridge and guess what? The game did not work. When I examined the wires, I've noticed that there is a five volt wire soldered to the PRG EEPROMs address 14 leg. So I disconnected the 5 volt wire and instead of it I connected CPU's address 14. Then I went for some testing. The CHR ROM was removed at that moment, but despite that surprisingly the game was actually working. Unfortunately when I inserted the CHR ROM back I've noticed that something is not right. Where's the HUD? This obviously happens due to the incorrect mirroring, because my cartridge mirroring was set as horizontal. The changes that I made in the NES ROM's header are only useful for the emulators. So I needed to resolder one wire from the cartridge's 18th contact pin to the CHR EEPROM's 21st leg. And guess what? It worked! Now I can finally see both different screens. So that's all the changes for now. What's next? I need to force the player out of the hut. Because there is no point of leaving the warm and comfy bed. So I need to implement a fuel system for the fireplace. So the fuel could run out and you would need to go out and look for some sticks or something. Also I need to add more screens. So I could go further than just two. I could bet that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. So if you want to know how far I will go, then subscribe the channel so you won't miss upcoming videos. As for my current progress, you can find the code and the games from in my git repository on GitHub. The links are in the description. So thanks so much for your time and see you in the next one. Bye!